Welcome to THE 1000, Introduction to Theater with Eric Kraft. The Critic The art of the theatre critic is an often misunderstood one, in large part because criticism itself is grossly misunderstood. Most people believe that all criticism is negative. This is not so, although it is easy to understand why people have come to believe this, because the most memorable quotations from theatre critics over the years have been the snarky ones. People tend to love gossip and the sting of a witticism. For example, here are some famous bad reviews from theatre critics. From Robert Benchley. Perfectly Scandalous was one of those plays in which all of the actors unfortunately enunciated very clear. From Walter Kerr. This is the sort of play that gives failure a bad name. From Brooks Atkinson. When Mr. Wilbur calls his play Halfway to Hell, he underestimates the distance. From George S. Kaufman. I saw the show under unfortunate circumstances. The curtain was up. From Dorothy Parker. This play wasn't just plain terrible. This was fancy terrible. This was terrible with raisins in it. From Haywood C. Brown. It opened at 8.40 sharp and closed at 10.40 dull. From Michael Billington. The musical Godspell has been revived. For those of you who missed it the first time, this is your golden opportunity. You can miss it again. Although the public and theatre artists may tend to remember these stinging witticisms, criticism is not necessarily bad or good. It can be both. The word criticism comes from the Greek word kritikos. Kritikos simply means the art of making judgments. The playwright, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, was also a theatre critic. He provides three good questions to ask in order to make reasoned judgments about plays. What did the playwright attempt to do? Did the playwright do it well? Was it worth doing? Goethe was not the only playwright who also writes a serious body of criticism as well as plays. George Bernard Shaw defended the practice in a critical essay entitled The Case for the Critic Dramatist. The discussion has arisen recently as to whether a dramatic critic can also be a dramatic author without injury to his integrity and impartiality. The feebleness with which the point has been debated may be guessed from the fact that the favorite opinion seems to be that a critic is either an honest man or he is not. If honest, then dramatic authorship can make no difference to him. If not, he will be dishonest whether he writes plays or not. This childish evasion cannot, for the honor of the craft, be allowed to stand. If I wanted to ascertain the melting point of a certain metal, and how far it could be altered by an alloy or some other metal, and an expert were to tell me that a metal is either fusible or not, that is, if not, no temperature were melted, and if so, it melt anyhow, I am afraid I should ask the expert whether he was a fool himself or took me for one. The advantage of having a play criticized by a critic who is also a playwright is as obvious as the advantage of having a ship criticized by a critic who is also a master shipwright. Bertolt Brecht, in creating the style that became known as epic theater, wrote several treatises defending the awakening of social consciousness in all of the artists in making the art of theater. The following is an excerpt from his A Short Organum for the Theater. Unless an actor is satisfied to be a parrot or a monkey, 
He must master our period's knowledge of human social life by himself joining the war of the classes. Some people may feel this is degrading because they rank art, once the money side has been settled, as one of the highest things. But mankind's highest decisions are in fact fought out on earth, not in the heavens. In the external world, not inside people's heads. Nobody can stand above the warring classes, for nobody can stand above the human race. Society cannot share a common communication system so long as it is split into warring classes. Thus, for art to be unpolitical means only to ally itself with the ruling group. How can the critic by making judgments be useful to the theatrical process? In his book, Theatre at the Crossroads, John Gassner writes how the effective professional critic can join into the system of making art by providing professional feedback that informs the art. An effective critic ultimately commands the respect of these creators even when his criticism is negative. He earns the right to be listened to by the closeness of his reasoning, the scrupulousness of his analysis, and the interest and originality of what he has to say. It must be evident that his condemnation is not born of mere whim, prejudice, or obtuseness. If his comments are astringent, it is more probably that those he hurts will be in no mood to appreciate his uninvited censure. Its solitary effects are never immediately apparent. If his criticism has any value, it will be recognized only after the wound is closed. If the critic is not heeded by those who have some vested interest in the theater of the present, he may instruct those who have none, a new generation pressing close upon the heels of the old. Ideally, the theater artists collaborate to create a performance. The audience and the professional critic interact with the performance and provide feedback that will hopefully inform theater artists as they go on to create future performances in this cycle of interactive artistic creation. There have been many critics who have championed great theater and helped it to thrive. As one example is the New York Times critic Brooke Atkinson, for whom the theater is named on Broadway and whose work during America's golden age of drama ushered in some of the United States' most celebrated playwrights. Here is Atkinson on Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. Arthur Miller has written a superb drama. From every point of view, Death of a Salesman, which was acted at the Morosco last evening, is rich and memorable drama. It is so simple in style and so inevitable in theme that it scarcely seems like a thing that has been written and acted. For Mr. Miller has looked with compassion into the hearts of some ordinary Americans and quietly transferred their hope and anguish into theater. Under Ilya Kazan's masterful direction, Lee J. Cobb gives a heroic performance, and every member of the cast plays like a person inspired. May you rot in hell if you leave this house. Exactly what is it that you want from me? I want you to know that on the trains, in the mountains, in the valleys, wherever you go, that you cut down your life for spite. Spite is the word of your undoing, and when you're down and out, I want you to remember when you're... Riding somewhere by the railroad track, I want you to remember, and don't you blame it on me. I'm not taking the rat for this. That's just what I'm telling you. You're trying to put a knife in me. Don't think I don't know what you're doing. All right, phony. Let's lay it on the line. Ah! I just leave it there. Don't move it. What's that? I, ne I never saw that. Now, what's this supposed to do, make a hero out of you? This supposed to make me sorry for you? There'll be no pity for you. You hear it? There'll be no pity. You hear the spice. No, you're going to hear the truth. What you are and what I am. Stop it! Cut it out The now. man don't know who we are. The man is going to know. And here's Atkinson on Tennessee Williams' Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is the work of a mature observer of men and women and a gifted craftsman. To say it is the drama of people who refuse to face the truth of life is to suggest a whole school of problem dramatists. But one of its great achievements is the honesty and simplicity of the craftsmanship. It seems not to have been written. It is a quintessence of life. It is the basic truth. Always a seeker after honesty in his writing, Mr. Williams has not only found a solid part of the truth, but found the way to say it with complete honesty. It is not only part of the truth of life, it is the absolute truth of the theater. Stay on it just as long as I have to. You could leave me, Maggie. There's no reason why, why we can't have a child when, whenever we want one. Are you listening? Are you listening to me? Yes, I hear you, Maggie. But how in hell on earth do you expect to have a child by a man that can't stand you? 
Thus, although we may have originally envisioned the critic as attacking the art of theater, this art of making reasoned judgments in actuality is something we all do. The more informed and sound the criticism, the more vital and beautiful will be the art of theater.